Welcome to We Are Libertarians. I believe this is episode 352. Uh, I pray that this is the last episode that we ever have to do on the Mueller Report. Uh, it's been like the fifth or sixth one that we've done, and I'm so tired of talking about the same thing. But as Dennis, as Reinhold, excuse me, said to me, you can't not do the show. You've got to talk about it. So here we are. Hody, Hody Johns joins us. Reinhold joins us, and we'll be back right after this. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, uh, one of the greatest podcasts of all time, uh, and I'll tell you why here in just a moment. So glad to be with you tonight. It's, man, it is spring. It's beautiful outside. We've got the windows open. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see behind me, the cherry blossoms are starting to the, look at, Reinhold is here. Uh, Harry is out in uh California, but yeah, you're in Harry's spot with Harry's new mic. Thanks to Jason Doolittle. Uh, look how beautiful that tree is. You're gonna have to talk into the mic. It's very beautiful. It looks like um, like the one out my house. I have a, a blossom tree like that too. That's just coming in. It's nice and pink and beautiful. It smells good. That it smells like it's, roses. Oh, it smells yeah. so great. Like roses. It's it's beautiful. And so Harry's out this week. He is in California, I believe, for work. Uh, and so Reinhold is sitting in his seat, farting in his chair, and is oh, using bro. a brand new mic. I am I'm over time going to upgrade the mics to uh, to from a, a fifty dollar mic to two hundred and fifty dollar mics. And and if Reinhold sounds beautiful tonight, it's thanks to Jason Doolittle who bought us one of those mics. It's all it's all that. See how Certainly not me. Hody Johns, how good does he sound? That bass baritone voice, I just want to kiss him every time, but uh, now especially. Like, Brett, I just want to be in the studio with you. Pull that mic out of the, the holster on that one, and let's do a little test comparison between, between these two mics here. Yeah, you have to unzip, because I have cat covers, so the cats don't get the, uh, the mic. The mic's all... Uh, you may just have to pull the whole stand over, honestly. This is taking longer than I thought. I Doolittle just, is the man, though, isn't he? Uh, who? Doolittle. Jason. Oh, is this one working or is it not? It's, it might. The mic, so no. It's pushed in. Oh. There you go. All right, you can't hear either, either of those two, so it's my podcast for just a minute here, guys. They're, uh, they're going to try to do a little comparison between Harry's old mic. You're going to hear his Atari microphone on the, that on the mic. uh, they invented right after. Uh, Testing. The, here we go. There we go. All right, yeah. All right. So I had to turn it on. It's a... The, technical trick that we have to use in this podcasting industry okay and now you have this sound does it sound a little bit deeper it's much clearer much clearer okay yes and so so i'll turn that mic off but the thing that might that particular mic gets muddy but here's the thing harry mumbles and so we needed a new mic so we can actually hear what what uh harry is saying because harry mumbles and so this is really going to help with that. And then we thank Jason Doolittle. You're right, Hody. He is the man. I love Jason Doolittle. He, uh, he's coming to Indy, and I'm going to Dallas at a couple points this year. So hopefully we can get dinner. And thank you to him for, for uh, sending us this beautiful Sure Beta 87A. It, it, like, it doesn't sound terribly different on yours. Reinhold, you have a, a nice voice. But yeah. for, on mine, it's like night and day. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So. I can tell the difference. You can? Oh, yeah. I mean, and yeah, maybe it's just that it's not Harry's mumbling into it, but it's yeah. very clear. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that is Hody Johns, the host of The Daily Shows, and he's also doing a great series right now where he is uh, hosting a debate between all of the uh, libertarian presidential candidates. You tried to get on all the other candidates, but really only the libertarians hit you back up. Is that what happened, Hody? For some reason, the name We Are Libertarians uh, might be an obstacle. No, the funny thing is I even had some real legitimate back and forth interaction with some of the Democratic candidates. Um, 
but the this part of the debate that we're on, the questions are not predisclosed, and that's a huge breaker for the Democratic and Republican candidates. For the Bill Weldkamp wants only pre-done questions. I don't think that's anybody's surprise, as well as all the Democratic candidates, you know, would like them all. They'd like the questions ahead of time. Honestly, fuck that's Bill Weldkamp. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. you the, the only media outlet that is going to interview you and was ever going to interview you was We Are Libertarians. You turned us down then. You turned us down now. Go fuck yourself, Bill Weld. You're not- the Bill Weld one's the most annoying because they send me spam to attend his events. As They're like, you're a journalist. Come to this event in Ohio, and I'll be there, and, and I won't take your questions, but you can like record me there. I, I oh, offered. That, some, yeah. that was a situation we had at the convention. At the, you were standing there, yeah, I believe. That and was, I, yeah, it was. I mean, what media outlet in the libertarian world is going to give Bill Weld an mm-hmm. honest and fair interview like we were going to give him that night, and he declined? Yeah. He talked to Abdul, but he wouldn't talk to, talk to us. Yeah. We had his back. I wrote very nice things yeah. about him. I was oh, like, I look, did. I get what you're going through. Every, I think everybody will, will, will uh, Say that you understand that I had kind of. I was defending him for a long time until he, yeah. even when he decided he was going to run as a Republican, I'm like, you know, that's his decision to make. And he thinks he could do a better job. I think he's wrong. But, but then when he went over there and he started saying, I'm glad to be back home in the Republican party. I don't have to lie about my stuff anymore. And it's like, screw you. You I, did not have to do that. You could right. have just said, Hey, you know, I'm glad you know, I'm, I'm here. I'm doing what I can do. You didn't have to, crap all over the libertarian party to do that i was not a welditarian and after that particular night i was even less enthused in terms of like g- giving him an honest fair shake yep. uh it it just was it was such a bad speech and then to deny like to talk to abdul fine mm-hmm. but 500 people a thousand people maybe listen to that interview that he did with Abdul. Yeah, and no, and none of the people listening to that are probably going to be voting libertarian yeah, circles in any way. It's the elite of Indiana yeah. politics versus ten thousand libertarians mm-hmm. that he, you know, it's just he's he's just a an idiot when it comes to strategy. He's a mm-hmm. bad messenger. He's got personal issues that are just like like the idea that I was ever going to feel or think about him or support him in the way that I ever felt or supported Gary Johnson just was never going to happen. Like he just, you know, he's just, he's just a, he's, he's is everything that those libertarians for a long time said he is. Well, I mean, he, he thinks that he's going to get all his media attention because he's going to be going against Trump in the primaries. And it's like, okay, great. But that ends as soon as you are no longer viable in the primaries you're done at that point nobody's gonna pay attention to you and if you had stayed libertarian you would have been all the way up to the election just pounding on trump because he hates trump that's his thing right he really 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 hates trump and i get that but after after uh next what april nobody's gonna pay any attention to him so i guess what i have to say hody is fuck bill weld in the neck (laughs) Uh, I'm not allowed to say that because I'm Mormon, but darn that guy. I am right there with you. <laughs> darn him, and I hope that he drinks some dirty caffeinated cola. Yeah. May he have a hot caffeinated beverage. Mm. <laughs> May all his Dr. Peppers go room temp before he gets them down. <laughs> oh, Hody. Um <laughs> I just want to say on the big show, you know, I'm big into public apologies, but I want to give a public compliment. This may be the first one that Dear Leader has ever given uh, to one of his subjects. But I want to thank Hody Johns, uh, first and foremost, for calling me the mountain, frankly. I mean, you were here when we talked (laughs) about... You you focus on the mountain. I think the cosmos is a little bit more impressive. Uh, I understand the, the mountain comment. Yeah, I mean, there was really uh, a, a doozy of a compliment that you gave me on what I don't know when if we're ever doing the brackets thing. Maybe I spoiled it by being too successful, too likable, getting too many votes, winning too much. Uh, and uh, the person who set up the brackets I'm facing next and doesn't want to lose. I'm not sure what's going on. If we're <laughs> Jared, are we going to do these uh, yeah, brackets? It's been or what? two weeks. Uh, what happened? Uh, well, I, I, I had everybody did, primed and ready to go, and we were going to win this, and I was driving people to their page, did, and then uh, nothing. I think Jared might be a little scared off of continuing this thing. I guess. After what happened. <laughs> uh, to, the mountain will crush him. Uh, that's right. Um, so – 
frankly, Hody, I, I, I like you the most of all because uh, you complimented me the best, but mostly you do the most work. You even, this has been the busiest for three or four months of my professional career, uh, my personal life really. And uh, you have just churned out content and research notes and, and I'm very thankful for you and you're doing a fantastic job and you're reaching out to new segments of the libertarian community that never fucked with We Are Libertarians, never listened. Uh, they like you. Uh, they'll never like me. They'll never see me they'll, like. Uh, they, they look at me and they see Reinhold, frankly. Uh, they see me as a weldatarian or they see me as, an, uh, as a minarchist or they see me as but you somehow have captured they the heart of the black and yellows. Um, Socialist. I so know. I have a love story with capitalism. I am going to display that love story. I'm actually going on a debate this weekend. I'm going to get it recorded and uh, we can, I'm sure they're fine with cross episodes and, and I'll get it on Weird Libertarians as well uh, with a mutualist socialist. And uh, it's going to be great. I, uh, I absolutely adore capitalism, and, but I'm also not a demagogue about it. That's what brings me to, that's what brought me to We're Libertarians was it was very open-minded, very culture-focused, and very into making a real difference as opposed to just prattling. Uh, you can definitely tell when there's philosophy for philosophy's sake, and then actually like making a difference in the world, loving people and making a real difference. And I'm glad that, that some of those have latched on to me and found that unity. But frankly, I'm glad that I'm bringing them over to We're Libertarians because there is an audience there and a message there that needs to be heard and understood. Uh, that's what brought me to this network to begin with, and it's beautiful. Yeah, so you've, you've done a fantastic job, and the debate series that you've done, nobody has done that in the history of my, at least in the 10 years I've been a libertarian. I don't think any media outlet has done the debate series that you've been doing. Mm -hmm. It's gotten great numbers, great reviews. Uh, when I was on Trisha Stewart's Facebook page, people were – saying Hody is the best is your best asset um i i did not take offense at that uh but Hody, i appreciate all the work that you do uh and i think people are really going to start thinking i'm this crazy if i keep this up though <laughs> no you're good man hey the, uh, the love is but, reciprocal thanks for but, giving me a voice but I, but I really do appreciate it yeah you do a great job and uh, that's the benefit of hooking into we are libertarians Hody gets thousands of people and i mean a relatively short amount of time you've you've got thousands of people listening to you you've got um a, a lot of recognition you're getting invited to johnny rocket's wedding when i didn't even get invited to johnny rocket's wedding which frankly reinhold we're going to have a discussion with both mark claire and mark johnny claire, rocket yeah. on the next <laughs> for the first time who, I'm, who knew roger paxton would be your best ally if you are a patron of any one of the league of liberty podcast which is the lava flow with roger paxton the lions of liberty with mark claire uh and several other has-beens uh who have their own podcast called the Do the league of doom and then uh johnny rocket of launchpad media and the blast off uh podcast you know i'm always cool with johnny and mark it's Roger I fight with, but yeah. this next episode, if you're a patron, you're going to hear me go after those two because I have beef with both of them. I don't know why I didn't get invited to Johnny's wedding, but, uh, but Hody did. I, I feel that uh, I, I've known Johnny longer. He's touched my butt, Hody. I don't know about you, but I have been fondled by Johnny Rocket. did he Rocket. kiss you on the mouth? He, <laughs> him cigarettes? It, he did try to kiss me on the mouth. He got, <laughs> I turned away and got the uh, kiss on the cheek, but yes, I have been molested by johnny rocket and you haven't hody so what gives Why well, I, well we don't know the whole story i, I have that. now <laughs> uh, how was the wedding of the century between kim ruff and johnny rocket let's just say that if kim got to as many bases with johnny as i did on his wedding night she had a thrilling evening uh he he's very handsy for a uh, for a straight male johnny is one of the most affectionate men i've ever met and it's, it's great. Johnny is such a nice person, and he's a good person. A tender, a tender hearted, sweet human being. Yes, just a very lovable guy. And I think it's funny because he, he does all the things that would make you say, uh, he's got the tattoos, he's got the smoking, there might have been mushrooms and weed at the party, I'm not allowed to say. But all that was there, but in all of it, as opposed to being this hard, gruff, so f these guys you know what my grandma would make of a guy like johnny rocket just the sweetest most complimentary when i showed up he just had such glowing things to say about me and my work that i was doing and it just it it was so refreshing to not have to compete with somebody 
and Johnny wow, is right just so nice about that. <laughs> and uh, my face, whatever. <laughs> uh, Chris, it, I tell you what, when we go to that uh, pool party in August, I will allow you to go to as many bases with me as Johnny did. But <laughs> let's just say, unlike Johnny, I don't know if we can have a camera going. Are you, are you really going? Yeah, Johnny's much more sexually open than I am. <laughs> um, that's for sure. <laughs> I, I was raised Methodist. We don't do some certain things in front of the camera. <laughs> um, now, Hody, are you really going to come to Indiana and go to the pool party at Boss Hogs in August? Yeah, uh, that's oh. the plan, and I want to do yeah. it, and I'm going to try to make it happen. This, this is the year, the whole reason I even attended that. I'm a shut-in, and I admit it. I'm trying to get out of that. That's one of those bad habits we're trying to break, just like me when I talk about being a, a, bu a bullying victim, trying to break that habit, and I'm really trying to be more involved with the community of people who actually care about me. That definitely includes you guys, and so I definitely want to come to, out there in August. Well, I will, I will definitely uh, use some We Are Libertarians funds and see if I can't pitch in to help with at least your, uh, your hotel or your airline ticket, so hit me up. Uh, you do to stay on your couch, isn't he? No. Uh, there's a lot of people coming into town, <laughs> and your leader needs his privacy. Um, but, uh, yeah, you do so much for us, and I want to help you out, so let's coordinate and uh, see if we can't make that happen. So, um, Awesome. Two hundred dollar rebate. That's it's <laughs> like Bernard's. Jamie, um, I just made us some money. Yeah. Uh, now, Hody, um, uh, you have done extensive notes about the Mueller investigation. Let me just say that I hope that this is the last time that this program has to discuss the Mueller investigation. Sweet summer child. We if have, you want to do it again? You're not going to have me on the program. <laughs> I I I, frankly, I just can't. So naive. <laughs> you know, I was, I had some stuff going on. I was, I was a little bit late tonight because I was seeing my nieces and I love my nieces as much as I love this audience. I love my nieces more. Uh, so I, I was just like, you know, maybe I'll cancel this episode. I'll take a break. I'm kind of, I'm struggling. I'm on the struggle bus. I'm going to be honest with the audience. Mm -hmm. Like I am just, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm burnt out <laughs> and uh, I need, I need what, uh, like those pastors have sabbaticals where they just go away for a month. Like for, I, I need like a two month sabbatical just away from not uh, just my whole life. Yeah. Like a, a nice month long vacation or something to reset my brain. But I'm taking a week. I'm going to a cabin in the woods, Bean Blossom, Indiana. There's a movie at, named that. At the, the, the Bill Monroe stomping ground. So I booked that. So I'll be, I'll have a nice week in July, but. Uh, I'm burnt out and it's, and it's topics like this that we just keep discussing over and over and over. And it's like, we didn't really learn a whole lot of new things in the Mueller report. It just was the government verifying a lot of what the New York times had leaked to it. Um, we're going to give you a full, well, a full report on the Mueller investigation. We're going to tell you what was in it. We're going to kind of give you some analysis. You know, I, I've done one episode on what is the Mueller report. We're going to do this episode on what is contained within it. Um, what's going to be the impact of it and what it will be the impact of it and then uh, we've, we've done a show on impeachment so hopefully that kind of gets you fully set up for, for the discussions and gives you all of the information that you might need um, but for a story where there isn't much there there we sure have spent a lot of time on this as a country and I think Hody and I are probably on opposite sides in some respects of Dennis who is a socialist uh, but you know they're they're just for for a th there seems to be a lot of time just wasted on this not just on this program but just in society in general like mm -hmm. you think there would be a little more to this when you really kind of get down into what was in this it's a lot of gossipy political intrigue but it, it is kind of everything that we have said on this program for for years the Mueller investigation is is based on the the steel dossier essentially and, and a lot of the conversation around russian collusion did donald trump collude with the russians to affect the election mueller mueller basically said what we've been saying on this show since 2017 no a there's no such thing as collusion donald trump's campaign was too ridiculous to actually collude <laughs> And that if, the, if any crimes were broken, they were process crimes that took place after the investigation had started. Or years before. Or years before of, in the case of Manafort. Mm -hmm. And so we're really dealing with a, a, a narrative that 
if, if you didn't, didn't go back, here's been my opinion of the Mueller investigation all along. We'll see if it kind of bears up in what, what was in the report. The, the Washington Examiner commissioned uh, basically some opposition research that uh, then the Hillary Clinton campaign picked up. It was put together by this guy named Christopher Steele. He went to Russia to investigate ties between Donald Trump and Russia. And some Kremlin agents and former Russian spies told him some crazy stories like the P-tape and other things. And that predicated the, the entire narrative that Donald Trump was compromised by the Russians. So we had to have an investigation on whether Donald Trump was compromised by the Russians based on the word of some Russians. And so the entire thing from 2016 on has just sort of been the Russians fucking us on both ends. You know, on one end, planting things on the, on the Democratic side saying this is happening, and then on the Republican side, you know, uh, shading dealings with Papadopoulos and some others. But the, the reality is that Steele dossier was uh, passed around Washington, D.C. In, in 2016, and that's really what got a lot of the elites st starting to talk about Donald Trump being compromised by Russia. Uh, then you also obviously had WikiLeaks, you had the DNC break-ins, you had, uh, which were all kind of melded together in the same narrative. And, and at the time, sometimes in the haze, you get things confused or, or it's, you, you conflate things that aren't maybe necessarily the same. But with hindsight, we now look back and go, yes, the Russians did break into the DNC servers and steal a bunch of emails. Well, that's not true. They didn't break in. <laughs> You can't break in when someone gives you the key. You can't break in when your password is password one two three four, and, and you, you give you, it to somebody. You fall for you're a boomer, and you fall for a phishing email, and you type your password in like John Podesta did. Yeah. So, this whole idea that WikiLeaks hacked the DNC servers or stole emails, um, yes. Well, the funniest thing too is when in that report that was commissioned by the third party who. Hillary brought in right right fusion gps they said basically that this hack was so sophisticated it could only be a state actor right how is a phishing they sent exploit? a phishing email and <laughs> so that not to get confused Hillary's campaign was hacked Robbie Mook was hacked in the phishing expedition and then also John Podesta was was a victim of a phishing expedition and then the DNC servers were also invaded by the Russian actors. None of it was hacking. It was falling for fishing expeditions. <clears throat> they they did do a little, a, a, a little, uh, uh, some things that would require some IT knowledge and know-how uh, outside of the, the spear phishing, the getting the password. They did duplicate their entire servers for the DNC and for Hillary's campaign. Yes, they didn't give them the actual servers. They gave them uh, copies of the server. Which... Well, so, so what happened was, is they, they got information they got access to their servers. They did not. So can't, uh, Hillary's campaign, obviously, they said, yeah, those emails aren't real. Uh, obviously, when you see an email you've sent word for word, you're aware you've been hacked. So, that, you know, lie to the public. You say, no, that's not real. And then try to keep it underground. So the issue was is they thought they could head it off because they didn't know that they had gotten as far as their servers. They thought they had only gotten, you know, some emails or maybe one computer. Yeah. Right. And they did do some key, key logging. So everybody that typed a sequence on of a computer, they had all that. And so what happened is they got access to the DNC and the Hillary campaign servers themselves. And what they did is they duplicated, uh, they made a, a duplicate server out in Ohio uh, and uh, they never caught who the agent was there. So that's actually kind of interesting. Uh, but duplicated a bounce off server there. So here's the thing, the DNC, Hillary, scrapped those servers, made new ones, but the Russians had it so that the coding went through those, the, the fake backup servers that the Russians had set up, even after they set up the new ones. So that's why there was kind of two rounds of leaks, was the first initial emails, and then people were like, oh man, they got hacked, and Hillary said it was all a lie. And then you had the really big hack, which was uh, like a month before the election, because they'd been collecting the whole time, unbeknownst to uh, the DNC and the Hillary campaign. Well, and, and the other thing, too, that came out of that, too, is they were trying to say, we know it's Russia. Well, how did you know it's Russia? The the investigation showed that, well, there were some IP addresses that came from Russia, which isn't proof of anything because you can bounce IPs, and most hacking people will do that. 
it wasn't, you know, they said, well, it was uh, all the activity took place between nine and five Russian time because we all know that hackers operate nine to five. <laughs> um, it, 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 it was just like some very, and, and there was some Cyrillic in, in some of the code because people don't buy and sell code and script kitties don't do that. I mean, it, those things in no way would prove that Russia was involved, but they were adamant that they were. Well, how did we find out that they were? The only possible explanation, and this is in some of the reporting that everybody's glossing over and not catching on to, is that they knew exactly who was sitting at the computer hacking into their system. How did they know that? The only way they could have known that is if they were already hacked into their <laughs> systems and knew what was going on, which is what happened. This is just... The, the thing that has driven me crazy about the Russia collusion investigation is that it just exposes the folly and the holes in the idea that the security services, the media, our political establishment are wise and have can, an understanding of what, what is going on. Like, it's just it's just all been bizarre. For when, me. when Putin was running for office, Hillary was bragging about setting up troll farms in Russia to help combat his election to keep him from getting elected. Right. Hello. How are you upset about doing somebody doing exactly what you did to them, to you? Right. That seems really crazy to me. The stuff that the United States has done in manipulating yep. elections and who's in charge of what country over the years. And, and here's the other thing too, I wanted to bring up before we get too far is everybody's complaining about Russia interfering in our elections. Last time I checked and, and maybe you can help me out here. Freedom of speech was an inalienable right. Mm -hmm. An inalienable right is a right that people have that governments don't give you. Therefore, governments can't take them away from you. Right. Therefore, the governments can't dictate who gets those rights and who doesn't. Right. Everybody gets those rights. Right. So why does Russia not have the right to free speech to say what they want to say in our election? Obama was over in the French election talking about how they should elect Macron. I mean, why are we suddenly so upset about that just because – it's somebody we don't like as i explained and i don't want to go too much further into the origins of the russian investigation because i really dove, dug deep i basically sat down with my friend lex who said explain the Mueller report to me explain what's going on with all this and so i did and i kind of outlined all the beginnings but the point with russia as i went into detail with her is that we after the cold war developed uh the military industrial complex as Dwight Eisenhower put it in his farewell address. These companies had made all this money in World War II creating and making weapons and then had all these employees and they said, well, this is a good profit center. And so it, it, then they had the, the Cold War and all of the weaponry that went with that and then the war on terror. And now that's winding down. And where are they going to find their bottom line? They still have to have hostile – they're really – the reality is the only competition that America has with Russia is in selling parts for military equipment sold to the Yemenis, to the Iranians, Syria. to the Syrians, to the – that is really the Cold War. That is the rush. And so they have to inflame the – the idea that Russia is the um, we need a big enemy. We yeah. need a big Let's enemy. Go back to the big hit, right? You know. China and Russia and America are fighting to sell weaponry to the rest of the world, and so therefore they're our enemy. And so you have this establishment, you have these think tanks, you have these companies that have big lobbying dollars, who all position Russia as the enemy because it's good for their bottom line, and they're selling death. And so if you buy into a lot of this, you're buying into the idea. Like, I'm not going to say that, that Putin is a good man because he's absolutely not. He is an absolute authoritarian who is an enemy of liberty and freedom in his country. He does pose a threat in terms of the security of our elections and, and the security of other nations around him. Wait, are you, wait, are you talking about Putin or are you talking Putin, about Trump? <laughs> right. Uh, oh, no. Putin is a Putin is effective and intelligent. <laughs> oh, there's the difference. Donald Trump. That. Donald Trump is the Keystone Cops, uh, as you'll we'll see in this report. Um, but so so go and listen to that a little bit more. But let's jump into it. And and Sam Schultz, our 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 main researcher now that Hody does more on the broadcasting side than he does on the research team side. 
Uh, Hody, I think you you would uh, seed the title of head researcher at this point, maybe to Sam. I mean, he does such incredible notes and I am so grateful to him for all that he does for uh, We Are Libertarians to make me look smart, especially since a lot of times I have not had the time to dedicate to research that I used to because of my professional endeavors. Check out the Miss Pat podcast called The Pat Down, by the way. Uh, that, that debuts April 30th. That's one thing that I've been working on. And Leaders and Legends, another podcast that I'm producing. Um, but uh, Sam Schultz helped us with these notes, and I want to thank him. I also want to thank our uh, patrons, Craig DaCosta, Jason Doolittle, Christy Avery, uh, the Libertarian Coalition. Uh, go on Facebook and just type in Libertarian Coalition. They have groups. They have pages. They're a great supporter of ours, as is Memerty Libs. Uh, which is a, a fun spinoff of Liberty Memes. Uh, they're a great supporter of ours. And so we appreciate them and all of our patrons at every level. You guys make this thing go around. Um, but let's let's jump into it, Hody. Let's talk about what was actually in the Mueller report. Um, I, I didn't give you a chance to, to praise Sam Schultz like we ought to. Uh, so oh, let me start on that. Drop of a hat. Like The thing is, he cuts in front of me. And so I'll be like, for me, I, I'm like, I check at certain times of the day, my social media and my Slack. Right. And so I'll see, I see the notes from Slack that night, be like, Hey, in a couple of days, we're going to do the Mueller report. And I'm like, okay, great. You know, I've already, I already did the Mueller investigation, the indictment papers. And so this will be easy to do the Mueller report. I was on vacation. I was going to read it and you know, on the ride home, I was going to read it all anyway. And then three hours later, he's like, it's done. <laughs> I, I read it and all the pages are done. And I'm just like, I, th- I, before I even got to check, he's uh, unbelievable. I have no idea what Sam looks like. I'm not Facebook friends with him. I've never had a conversation with him. He's just a brilliant dude who really helps us out a lot, and we just greatly appreciate him as much as we appreciate Hody. Uh, reviews are coming for all of the co-hosts, and Hody and Sam are the only two that have an A-plus rating. Uh, uh, yep. <clears throat> I have been letting... You need a dad. <laughs> uh, so let's let's give you some basic facts. Let's get into the let, let's get into the details of the Mueller report. Uh, so Robert Mueller, special investigation uh, special investigator, office of the independent. I, I don't know. But we'll get into it. Uh, Robert Mueller was appointed special counsel to investigate collusion between Donald Trump and Russia. And he released his report on Thursday, April 18th. It's 448 pages. It's split into two volumes. The first is kind of talking about Donald Trump's ties with uh, his campaign and, and Russia. And then also 10, quote unquote, episodes where Mueller said there was potential evidence. I also want to thank Christy Avery. I think I might have less Christy Avery off of that list of patrons. If I, if I did, I apologize. Um, so... Um, Mueller found no criminal conspiracy between the president's team and Russia. Mueller declined to recommend charges against Trump, but found several incident instances where the president tried to influence or shut down the investigation. So let's dive into the first part. Was there a conspiracy or collusion by the Donald Trump campaign and Russia to influence the outcome of the election? Now, that was the main thrust of why Robert Mueller was appointed to investigate all of this to begin with. Um, now we've, I've said kind of all along that no special counsel gets appointed and finds nothing. This is about as close as you're going to get to nothing. Uh, but they found some things. A lot of that is process kind, uh, uh, crime. So anyways, um, for much of Mueller's time as special counsel, the media has focused on possible collusion between Trump's campaign and Russia. Now, collusion has no legal definition and is not a federal crime, but Mueller did look into whether the Trump campaign purposefully worked with Russia to win the 2016 election. This would be considered, considered a conspiracy, which is a federal crime. So if, uh, if Don Jr. and Don Trump Donald Trump and Jeff Sessions are on the campaign and they go, what if we reached out to Vladimir Putin to hack into Hillary Clinton's servers and give us information and publish it through WikiLeaks? That would be a conspiracy. They are sitting down and working out how to orchestrate illegal activity for the purposes of um, they're breaking laws, they're conspiring to break laws. It's much like 
Richard Nixon conspiring with people to break into the Watergate, for instance. Uh, I don't think he actually ever said break into the Watergate, but let's let's just go on the on the easy stuff. Collusion means nothing. If on the back end, a Russian spy meets with Donald Jr. in the in Trump Tower and brings some things up, or uh, Roger Stone has a conversation with some Russian agent about WikiLeaks, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a conspiracy or, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's a crime, right? right. No. But it, it's different it, if they had intent to create a conspiracy. Or if they were, they were saying, okay, um, let's coordinate our messaging, or I'll, I'll say this, and then you, re, then you release this out the next day, and then we can hit them with a, a one-two punch. The, the argument that was made by the left was that the big dump of information that came out happened just the day after something came out about Trump, the, the uh, grab him but, uh, by the pussy. Maybe. I think it was that same. That was that next day when all that information was dumped, and they think that it was coordinated because mm -hmm. of the timing was too good. Right. But really what it is is Julian Assange mm -hmm. hates Hillary Clinton. Yes. And, and what you really find out, and you heard this in our WikiLeaks episode, uh, Julian Assange exposed a lot of, uh, uh, like, what, 250,000 diplomatic cables of the Hillary Clinton's, uh, uh, when she was Secretary State. of State. Yeah, including and, the 2009 Honduran coup that we backed, right. which is causing all the big problems when the south on the border right now. And she literally had, like, drones that were going to kill Julian Assange at one point. Like the, people forget well, She said that. she was going to do she, it. She was going Into to the embassy. Yeah, yeah. She was going to kill Julian Assange. And so Julian Assange after that kind of had a bad taste in his mouth about Hillary Clinton. So did Vladimir Putin because he, he was uh, on the, he was on the wrong side of Clinton. He survived. Um, but Julian Assange hates Hillary Clinton. And so any chance he could to screw Hillary Clinton, he was going to do uh, to get revenge for what had happened, you know, f a few years before when she was Secretary of State. So people forget that. Mm -hmm. that people, people want to see a conspiracy when really it's just Donald Trump doesn't yeah. know what Julian Assange is doing and it's not coordination. Well, it's, it's Julian Assange sitting there with all his information and he's just waiting and then all of a sudden this happens. He's like, oh, this will be a perfect time. Yeah, exactly. Oh, right. There they go. There's right. no coordination behind it. It's just that's what Julian said it would be a, a good way to go. Now they're complaining that Trump did say, "Hey, you know, if Hillary could hack, if they could hack into Hillary's email server and get those emails that nobody can find, then maybe we can lock her up." Hell yeah! And then he said, "You know, they're they're saying that that was him telling the Russians to hack." And like, first of all, they had already been in for six months to, or even longer before that happened. So that seems kind of strange that you would think that that. And the other thing was that he was telling them to go after Hillary's server. And that's not where most of the problem the problem came from the DNC. All right. It, it's, I hate to validate the left, but there are two points I got to bring up here. All right. Please, Hody. You're going to have right. to jump in because one of the problems yeah, doing with it. having somebody on the Zoom <laughs> is that when the, the in-person people get to talking, we forget somebody's on the Zoom. So please. All right. Cannonball, I'm jumping in. Uh, okay. So Manafort did explicitly ask Guccifer 2.0, that phony account that they had set up with all the leaks, for all of the leaks when they gladly provided it to him. So a member of his campaign did ask for it. The other thing is they note the Russian investigation. They noticed that Trump had not done anything with that information that they knew that they had given to Manafort. So after that, they sent the information again to Roger Stone and they said, Hey, we really want to help you out. Stone didn't respond. And they said, Hey, Hey, did you get our stuff? Like we really want to help you out. And uh, Stone, let me see here. He, he had a two-word answer for him. He just, uh, they were like, uh, does it look like it can help? And he just said, pretty standard. Now, the issue is Stone got in trouble because he said, I, I, I have no idea what's going on here. And he responded to them. So obviously, he had seen the stuff that was going around. But those are the two biggies. Now, as far as does that mean that Trump told them to do it? No, but I'm just providing at least an iota of validation before we completely rip apart why that doesn't mean Trump was complicit. Right. There, I just figured that those are the two things that really the media is going off of. Is, is those there's, uh, there's it's clear indication that there's a lot of people who are in the Trump campaign who really did not have any business being there and didn't know what they were doing. Yeah. Yep, that too. Including the candidate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. Without saying. Well, and, and, Donald Trump. And for me. You're supposed, to, you're supposed to surround yourself with people who are smart and know what's going on. And uh, they, 
he, he seems to fail on that too. Right. You coordinate it. Well, I mean, you look at Whitewater, right? Massive scandal, millions of do- taxpayer dollars stolen, you know, uh, uh, illegal campaign finance raise. And what do you do? You have 13 people, uh, what, convicted and you overturn the convictions of the nine that don't testify against you and allow the four that did to rot, right? Whereas Trump, I think he's so out of the loop. I mean, he's not providing cover for any of these guys. So for me, that's, for me, that is my biggest validation that he didn't know what was going on. And it sounds like his campaign chairs thought he was too stupid to even be in that loop because he's not pardoning them or commuting their sentences or anything. He just says, well, if that's what they did, then, then they're in trouble and not well, me. And the is thing there, is, I think they even knew that they couldn't trust what Trump would do. Sure. Because he's just too unpredictable on that sort of stuff. So they didn't want to involve him in any way because they didn't want him, have, you know, squelching or, or screwing up what they were trying to get away with. Yeah. And, and imagine now. And so here, here's that's part of it. The other thing is, and the Mueller report does specifically, or uh, yeah, the report specifically states if we thought that he was he could be completely vindicated we would say so we did not find any evidence of complete vindication here that's standard of these reports like you already mentioned earlier chris it, it's you're going to find something and they're never going to it's hard to positive what it positively negatively prove whatever the thing is that's impossible to do so it's not a surprise unless you'd videotaped every single second of his life that he had nothing to do with it what right? i also like too is in the in the report not only did they say that there's not that they found no evidence of conspiracy, mm-hmm. which is, is not him saying there was no conspiracy. It's him saying we found no evidence of it. So right. there's no way we could say that there is. Yeah. Uh, but he also said that what WikiLeaks did didn't rise to the level of conspiracy either because they were getting information from somebody who took it from someone else, and that's perfectly legal for them to do. And any contact that the Trump campaign might have had with WikiLeaks is irrelevant because they weren't acting – in a in a uh, illegal manner in any way at that point. So let's highlight a couple things on this particular issue before moving on to obstruction, which is really going to be the focus of the conversation moving forward. Uh, because as we have said since 2017, the Russian collusion narrative is a big nothing burger, uh, no matter how much everybody hyperventilates in the media over it. Um, but what, when you look through the report, you really do see the vindication of like, the New York Times, if you just read the New York Times over the last two years about the Russia investing, all those scoops that they had over the years, you kind of, like, that's the report. If yeah, you just we, paid attention to the mainstream media, you, you saw kind of what was, so you didn't see anything in the report, at least in this portion, that was anything surprising if you just read the newspaper. Which in, in some way vindicates the New York Times. So not right. only are we vindicating Trump on the conspiracy thing, we're also vindicating some of the mainstream media against their fake news charges. Uh, I, it vindicates the reporting of the New York Times yeah. because they were right. Mm-hmm. But the opinion the, the, page and the, the commentators, especially on the left, you yeah, go, CNN is, why did you have a different opinion of any of this? CNN's just laughable at yeah. this point. I was watching CBS uh, news. So cause I, I can't, I'm to the point where I can't do CNN anymore. Yeah. I cannot do Fox. I cannot do... MSNBC, what's left? Well, there's CBS as their as their network now, so I'm watching it, and it's so poorly produced. And it's really, and yeah, it's really, it's like watching a podcast. And then, <laughs> <laughs> but the but the funny part was they were sitting there focusing on the fact that well, why is you know why is everybody talking about collusion in this report? It doesn't make any sense. I mean, even Mueller just kind of briefly mentions the word collusion, and it goes into how it's not a, anything he can really talk about, and. It's not a real thing. So why is everybody talking about this collusion thing? Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's because the media has been talking about, is there any collusion for two years? Oh, every day over and, and, that and over was, and over again. That yeah. was the messaging for two years. Even, Maybe that's why it was being brought up. Even Easter morning after the Sri Lanka bombings, it, it was all CNN was talking yeah. about was collusion in the Russia report. It's at, at a certain point you go, this is propaganda. Yeah. So let me read a couple passages uh, just so you get a flavor of this portion. Uh, Summer 2016, Russian outreach to the Trump campaign continued into the summer of 2016 as candidate Trump was becoming the presumptive Republican nominee for president. On June 9th, 2016, for example, a Russian lawyer met with senior Trump campaign officials Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, and campaign chairman Paul Manafort to deliver what the email proposing the meeting had described as, quote, official documents and information that would incriminate Hillary 
end quote. The materials were offered to Trump Jr. as, quote, part of the Russia and its government support for Mr. Trump, end quote. The written communication setting up the meeting showed that the campaign anticipated receiving information from Russia that could assist candidate Trump's electoral prospects, but the Russian lawyer's presentation did not provide such information. On August 2nd, uh, this is a different paragraph. On August 2nd, 2016, Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort met in New York City with his longtime business associate, Konstantin Kaliminik, who the FBI assesses to have ties to Russian intelligence. Kal Kalimik, uh, Konstantin requested the meeting deliver in person a peace plan for Ukraine that Manafort acknowledged to the special counsel's office was a, quote, backdoor, end quote, way for Russia to control part of the eastern Ukraine. Both men believe that the plan would require candidate Trump's assent to succeed were he to be elected president. They also discussed the status of the Trump campaign and Manafort's strategy for winning Democratic votes in Midwestern states. Months before that meeting, Manafort had caused internal polling data to be shared with Kalimnik, and the sharing continued for some period of time after their August meeting. The implication there being that uh, Russians would start uh, influencing in Minnesota on social media, for instance. Um, I don't know that that particularly happened, but that's kind of the inference with that particular piece of information. But w that meeting, for instance, with uh, the Russian lawyer on June 9th of 2016, having a meeting with someone that promises damaging information against your opponent, that isn't criminal conspiracy. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. That's all my job was at the Libertarian Party when it came to you know, a lot of my job was having lunch with people that gave me intel on my competition. And so that's just part of the game. That's, that's a lot of what Roger Stone was saying is that you're going to criminalize political gossip. You're going to lock up every political operative in this nation. There's a phrase, oppo research, that has been thrown out for years and years and years. Right. And it's like, it's... It's such in the lexicon that it's obviously that it happens all the time. And I don't understand why. It's just part of it. And so yeah. w nothing happened with that meeting. And so often in so much of the reporting, you just go, what is CNN talking about? Because when you read the New York Times article, you walk away and go, well, the Russians tried, like they try with every other campaign. If you had done the due diligence to try and find Russian ties to Hillary Clinton's campaign, uh, <coughs> Clinton cash. Uh, sorry, I had something stuck in my throat. It was selling all of the uranium rights to the Russians uh, while Hillary was state, Secretary of State. Somebody, um, somebody check in on uh, your leader the next few days. Just yes, to make sure. just to make sure. I, I, I am not feeling suicidal. I'm having the best week of my entire life. Um, so I, am, I have, never mind. I was going to tell you all the ways that I'm having a great. Talking about Bill Weldon, the Mueller report. How can you not be in paradise right now, right? right. I mean, this fantastic. Yeah. Um, no, I'm having, I'm uh, it's best, best my life has ever been. I'm not feeling suicidal in any way, shape or form. Uh, right. But if you had investigated the Hillary camp for Russian in, you know, trying to enter the campaign in various ways, you would have found the same level that you found in the Trump campaign mm -hmm. of lunches or meetings or, or at least attempted associates meetings. or I mean, attempted they meetings. May, they may have been smart to say, no, we know who you are. We're not going to meet with you, but yeah, they may not have. And I don't, I think there's some indication that when they went after the steel report, which was basically Russian disinformation it, it was campaign. Kremlin, it was Kremlin, <laughs> the Kremlin handed information to steel and yeah. Steele then took it to John McCain's camp, who then gave it to the FBI and Comey. And then out of that... Then it went to the Hillary camp. We had to investigate if Russians were interfering in our election based on the Russians interfering in our election. Like, I can't... Yeah. It's so mind-bendingly stupid and it's, obvious. It's, it's a conclusion that they have that they're trying to prove. They've yes. been trying to prove since the beginning because they want... The, they want the, they've been pushing this thing with Russia for years. Yeah. Hillary started it. There's people in her camp that are real big in the Ukraine issue. Ukraine, there's some Ukrainian forces who really want us to go to war with Russia, right? Right. Because of long-held issues that are going on over there. And they've infiltrated in Hillary's camp. And so she turned around from us saying that the new, the new Russia is our friend to, oh, no, Putin might get a, an, 
that Putin might get elected, so we need to stop that. Oh, they're now it's an oligarchy. They're destroying the world. They're going to try and do all this stuff. I mean, it's, it's it's crazy to watch it and not realize that these people who are supposed to be smart and reporters and people who've been around politics for a long can't see this. Yeah. Uh, so let's kind of put this this narrative to bed because we got a lot on obstruction to talk about, which I'll get to. But uh, the report states, this is our research, the report states the investigation found numerous links between individuals with ties to Russia and individuals associated with the Trump campaign, but not enough evidence to support criminal charges. Quote from the report, while the investigation identified numerous links between individuals with ties to the Russian government and individuals associated with the Trump campaign, the evidence was not sufficient to support criminal charges. Oh, I just said that. Among other things, the evidence was not sufficient to charge any campaign official as an unregistered agent of the Russian government or other R Russian principal. And our evidence about June 9, 2016 meeting and WikiLeaks releases of hacked materials was not sufficient to charge a criminal campaign finance violation. Further, the evidence was not sufficient to charge that any member of the Trump campaign conspired with representatives of the Russian government to interfere in the 2016 election. And so there we finally have it. None of this was, it was, it was all bullshit. And if you had just listened way back when Greg was a co-host, you would have known this from the very beginning. Um, if you listen to We Are Libertarians, first to hear about ISIS, first to first program uh, to call Putin a dictator, first program <laughs> to call the Mueller investigation nonsense. So now here's where it gets dicey for Trump. I don't think it gets dicey for Trump. Our dear socialist friend Reinhold may disagree. He called he called him Nixon earlier this week. Uh, Trump isn't fit to hold Nixon's sandals. Okay, there's just nothing. That Nixon was an artist when it came to being a criminal. He was the best gangster of the twenty first, the, the twentieth century. Donald Trump is a is a oh. hack compared to the great Richard Nixon when it comes to being a criminal. I'll respond later um, to that. So here's my problem with ob obstruction of justice. Uh, you want to impeach the president on obstruction of justice for ranting in the White House that he doesn't like the Mueller investigation and nothing ever happens but that's impeachable because he doesn't like the Mueller investigation because he feels his presidency is being unfairly attacked we already see that the foundation of the entire investigation had no merit we've known that if we had just read the newspapers from the very beginning and now the problem with obstruction in general is that it's a process crime you essentially say, I'm going to set up a dragnet and I'm going to capture crimes like perjury and obstruction. It, 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 like, the more libertarian I become, Dennis, I just go, your, your laws are nonsense and this is nothing. This is meaningless. And Donald Trump, an obstruction of justice, if Donald Trump had done a lot of the things that, that Nixon had done, for instance, then it's concerning then it's an abuse of power. But a lot of what you're going to hear through this, my initial analysis, my initial thought is a lot of this is just him ranting and being Trump, and this is who we thought Trump was, and everybody just ignored him, and no crimes were actually committed. It's just bad behavior by a person that we know has bad behavior. And as a result, I'm not going to elect him in, in 2020. I'm not going to personally vote for him. Um, do, do, should we jump into the analysis now or should we well, kind of get the me, facts first and then, then, then talk about it? Well, I just want to kind of counter a few things okay. that you're saying. Um, I mean, and, and we probably should get through some of the details first because there's probably some of that stuff's going to get brought up in that. But Nixon was, was accused of doing a lot of things, but none of it was ever proven. He was not, as far as I'm aware, and I was around about that time um he didn't order the break-in at watergate now he had an enemies list he was a paranoid man who hated the media and sounding familiar to me all the time but um his his big fall was trying to cover up the break-in after it was discovered mm -hmm. that it was it was involved with it was related to the uh, the campaign which 
there's a, there's a whole story about that that I heard from uh, G. Gordon Liddy about the real reason why the DNC was burgled, and it wasn't because of Nixon's campaign because Nixon was winning hands down. There was no reason for them to do that. Right. There was he, something specific they were going after. And he, it was he only lost this. <laughs> he only lost Minnesota, where yeah. his opponent was from. Basically, it was a yeah. massive landslide. Yeah. So the, the the whole idea that he that he ordered the break in because he was trying to win that election is just wrong. They were going in after some opposition research, oppo research that they were that the dnc had on another republican about that republican's wife right so when he found out about it he said hey how can we prevent this from leaking out therefore he was covering it up therefore he was a that's why he was going to get impeached right that that was the simpleness of it 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 wasn't like he was doing massive fraud or anything like that Mm mm-hmm didn't well, think I ever hear Dennis vouch for Nixon. Uh, a big problem. With, <laughs> a big problem with Nixon is that he had a a consistent pattern of breaking the law of of obstruction of justice. Well, uh, I mean, during, during really the Watergate s- thing, he did do some things he shouldn't have done. Um, but those are the things that we're saying Trump tried to do. He ordered McGahn to fire Mueller. McGahn just didn't do it. Yeah, he fired Comey. He fired Sessions. Those are things he did that could be considered obstruction of justice. Yeah. The problem is, is that it's irrelevant whether it'll hold up in a legal court or not. Yeah. All right. So let's jump into it. Hody, did you have something you wanted to say? Well, I mean, we're, you're about to discuss the details, right? Because yeah. I don't know nothing about that Boomer Clint Nixon stuff. I'm, right. I'm ready for the, the, the Mueller stuff. That's my expertise. So jump, All right. Jump let's, let's, get, let's get into the 10 episodes Mueller investigated for obstruction of justice. Yes. So first is the conduct involving FBI Director Comey and Michael Flynn. Quote, in mid-January 2017, incoming National Security Advisor Michael Flynn falsely denied to the Vice President, other administration officials, and FBI agents that he had talked to Russian Ambassador Sergei, Sergei Kislyak about Russia's response to U.S. sanctions on Russia for its election interference. On January 27th, the day after the president was told that Flynn had lied to the vice president and made similar statements to the FBI, the president invited FBI Director Comey to a private dinner at the White House and told Comey that he needed loyalty. On February 14th, the day after the president requested Flynn's resignation, the president told an outside advisor, now that we fired Flynn, the Russia thing is over. The advisor disagreed and said the investigations would continue. Later that afternoon, the president cleared the Oval Office to have a one-on-one meeting with Comey. Referring to the FBI's investigation of Flynn, the president said, I hope you can let this go. Shortly after requesting Flynn's resignation and speaking privately to Comey, the president sought to have National Security Advisor um, K.T. McFarland draft an internal letter stating that the president had not directed Flynn to discuss sanctions with Kislyak. McFarland declined because she did not know whether that was true. And a White House counsel's office attorney thought that the request would look like a quid pro quo for an ambassadorship she had been offered. So the, the first charge is the, the I mean, it seems like forever ago that we learned about, uh, I hope you can let this go. Never felt that that was necessarily obstruction. It's it highly a, stupid. It was, it was <laughs> very vague and not yeah. direct and Comey ignored it. The the a lot of this is just people ignoring Trump, like we all ought to do. Yes, if we ignore him, he will go away. I Um, I ignored him 2016, and he didn't go away. I know. (laughs) So, second is the president's reaction to the continuing Russia investigation. Um, You know, what you what you really have to think in your mind is the president using his authority to sabotage an investigation into his presidency is he is he doing things that uh that rise to a level of like you you could argue that if he had fired uh mueller for instance the report would never be released and uh it 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 would be obstructing justice essentially um you know firing uh, asking comey to let this whole thing go who knows what that means? That's very vague. You can't get at intent, and you'll never get an intent. Uh, so, but the second is his reaction to the continuing Russia investigation. In February 2017, um, 
excuse me, uh, Jeff Sessions, attorney general, began to assess whether he had to recuse himself from the campaign-related investigations because of his role in the Trump campaign. Sessions was an early adopter of the Trump campaign and a, and a, and a big advisor to Trump in 2017 on uh, uh, affairs relating to foreign policy and immigration. Uh, in early March, the president told White House counsel Don McGahn to stop Sessions from recusing. And after Sessions announced his recusal on March 2nd, the president expressed anger at the decision and told advisors that he should have an attorney general who would protect him. That weekend, the president took Sessions aside at an event and urged him to unrecuse, quote unquote. Later in March, Comey publicly disclosed at a congressional hearing that FBI was investigating the Russian government's efforts to interfere in the 2016 election, including any links or coordination between the campaign and Russia. I'm in the following days, the president reached out to the director of the CIA and the NSA to ask them what they could do publicly to dispel the suggestion that the president had any connection to the Russian election interference. The president also qu twice called Comey directly, notwithstanding guidance from McGahn to avoid direct contacts with the Department of Justice. Comey had previously assured the president that the FBI was not investigating him personally, and the president asked Comey to, quote, lift the cloud of the Russia investigation by saying that publicly. Um, so he was basically looking for PR coverage. Uh, he was he was hoping that he would say publicly he's not a target of the investigation. Comey, who works for the president, um, you know, we all have this idea that somehow the the uh, Justice Department and the FBI and the CIA and all these departments are supposed to be just above politics, when in fact it's inherently political. Um, and what Trump wanted from Comey essentially was for him to say that he wasn't under investigation. Comey would not do that. And so that angered the president. In my mind, again, not necessarily obstruction. It was, help me with my PR campaign. And let me interject real quick, yeah. just because I think this point is relevant to all 10 of these things that get brought up. Ask yourself, because it's bad behavior, but is this behavior of somebody who doesn't like people questioning him, who doesn't like being you know being undermined or is this the behavior of somebody who's actively trying to hide something i compare this to the uh deflate gate report with tom brady because that was cool that was totally uh, visible you can read all that <laughs> whereas you you get a guy who's suddenly breaking his cell phone like in in front of investigators and and promising to meet him someplace and not meeting him elsewhere that's when you start to be like uh you're like actively destroying evidence right now yeah. versus uh, or is this the behavior of a guy who just doesn't like being questioned I hate it. It's bullying behavior, especially the one we just mentioned. We talked about bullying earlier today. I hate it. I have like a, a very big aversion to it. Well, it's, but it's it, erratic, irrational behavior that he displays constantly, right? I mean, that's that's part of his personality. We we've seen it on The Apprentice for years. You know, he sure. just uh, that's the way he operates, and it's always it's not always the best, smartest thing to do. And in many cases, in this, in this situation. You've got some, you got people coming after you for an investigation. Shut up mm -hmm. and don't rock the boat. It's like the uh, Pot Brothers. Have you How seen the Pot Brothers? Uh, Pot Brothers at Law. What's the script? Uh, I, I got to play this for you uh, if you've not seen it. <laughs> All so, right. While you're pulling that up, are we going to talk about the I'm effed comment? Uh, Which I think is really uh, uh, we Is that coming up? Like okay. okay. I will bring it up now. <laughs> Go find your prop, Pot Brothers thing. Because that to me is hilarious. Yeah, it's just. Alicia Dern just constantly repeats that every like every 
month, she posts, just shut up. Don't talk to police. Never talk to police. So that is the Pot Brothers at Law. You can uh, just go to YouTube, find uh, the Pot Brothers script, and you'll find that. The great Instagram. Uh, the, 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 should just, I'm not discussing my day. I love it. Uh, so the next obstruction question is the president's termination of Comey. On May 3rd, 2017, Comey testified at a congressional hearing but declined to answer questions about whether the president was personally under investigation. Within days, the president decided to terminate Comey. The president insisted that the termination letter, which was written for public release, stated that Comey had informed the president that he was not under investigation. The day of the firing, the White House maintained that Comey's termination resulted from independent recommendations from the AG and Deputy AG that Comey should be discharged for mishandling the Hillary Clinton investigation, uh, the email investigation. But the president had decided to fire Comey before hearing from the Department of Justice. The day after firing Comey, the president told Russian officials that he had faced great pressure because of Russia, which had been taken off by Comey's firing. The next day, the president acknowledged in a television interview that he was going to fire Comey regardless of the DOJ's recommendation and that he decided just to do it. Uh, again, not helping his case. Uh, <laughs> shut the fuck up Friday, Mr. President. He was thinking that this thing with Trump Russia is a made-up story. In response to a question about whether he was angry with Comey about the Russia investigation, the president said, as far as I'm concerned, I want the thing to be absolutely done properly, adding that firing Comey might even lengthen out the investigation. Uh, so he said one thing and then did the exact opposite the, the, a few days later. Um, so... And the next point of obstruction was the appointment of a special counsel and the efforts to remove him. On May 17, 2017, acting AG for the Russia investigation, Rod Rosenstein, appointed a special counsel, Robert Mueller, to conduct the investigation and related matters. The president reacted to news that a special counsel had been appointed by telling advisors that it was the end of his presidency and demanding that Sessions resign. I'm fucked. Sessions submitted his resignation, but the president ultimately did, ex did not accept it. The president told aides that the special counsel had conflicts of interest and suggested that the special counsel, therefore, could not serve. The president's advisors told him and asserted that asserted conflicts were meritless and had already been considered by the DOJ. On June 14, 2017, the media reported that the special counsel's office was investigating whether the president had obstructed justice. Press reports called this a major turning point in the investigation. While Comey had told the president that he was not under investigation following Comey's firing, the president was now under investigation. The president act, reacted to this news with a series of tweets to, criticizing the DOJ and the special counsel's investigation. On June 2017, 2017 the president called McGahn at home, who is his lawyer, basically, for the White House, and directed him to call the acting AG and say that the special counsel had conflicts of interest and must be removed. McGahn did not carry out the direction, however, deciding that he would resign rather than trigger what he regarded as a potential Saturday night massacre. Now, this was something that happened with Nixon a lot. So uh, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, I've heard Pat Buchanan say this, that what, what, what happened with Nixon is he would call somebody late at night and say, do this, and then they would not do it. And if he called them back in and he said, ah, uh, you son of a bitch, I told you to fire him again. Why didn't you do it? Then they would fire him again. But if he never brought it back up again, they just ignored him. They just didn't do it. Right. This is very common in White Houses. You just, this is, this is a, a, a standard operating procedure that a president will get pissed and you don't necessarily do, it happens all the time. Like we have this illusion that the president, when the president speaks, it's like the Roman emperor and we just do what he says. Well, we were West Wing for years. Right. The idea that the president is just this wise man sitting on a hill and he's Martin Sheen and he's from New Hampshire. It's not true. Like a president gets mad and gets pissed and spouts off and says this and gets, has these delusions of grandeur and then people ignore him. And then if he's really serious, they carry it out. And that's what McGahn did here. And McGahn saves his butt a few times. Uh, the, the whole presidency basically has been Donald Trump getting mad, flying off the handle, and everybody ignoring him, and therefore everything's fine. But we all act like the world is coming to an end because Donald Trump is president, when really nobody's listening to him. He's the emperor that has no clothes. 
Uh, so, you know, he calls him. And so it's not necessarily obstruction of justice if the president has a feeling and he has an opinion. Right. And but then, but there's, nothing there's, ever happened with it. But if you say, oh, I'm really mad at this person, I wish he wasn't here, is different than, I want you to fire him. I mean, that is a different thing. If, if McGahn had not been, you know, had followed through with that, mm-hmm. that would have been just. It would have been. Yeah, water it would have been water. Well, right. but, there's, but there's a thing well, we have in this country called attempted things. Attempted rape, attempted murder. That's, that's not. There's an attempted obstruction of justice. It, 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 like, that's. It, attempted, I, attempted, I'm not saying attempted murder is not, basically if if I put my hands around your neck right now, physically touch you and strangle you, that's attempted murder. If I say, you know, Reinhold, I want you to be dead. Mm-hmm. I'm going to kill you. That's a threat. That's that's freedom of speech. Still, like, no, you're still prote- still against the law. No. It, I'm not going to jail for saying that on a podcast right now. I want Dennis to die. Everyone right. should know that. That's, but that's different kill than any I will kill you. Facebook. Kill Dennis. Right. Somebody. Uh, but what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, is I, I, don't, I think it's all bullshit. Right. I'm not saying that it's not bullshit. I'm, I'm just saying that there's that case to be made. And if you're politically inclined, you can take that and you can go – because. Trump did not help himself in any way, shape, or form several times through this whole thing. He could have, it could have all gone away if he had just shut up and not done all this stuff and just let it handle it. Then, you know, and just let the Democrats blah, blah, blah. Then when it came out, he could have walked away clean mm-hmm. and just said, oh, see, but that's, and that's what he's trying to do. But it's not going to work because now he's put, he's created this whole paper trail of bad behavior as seen by certain people and that's all you need in order to go into the house of representatives and have an impeachment two, what do you, uh, yeah, what do you two things two things so one is let's there's a direct comparison we can make with the clinton thing right now clinton got caught on tape telling his secretary to lie under oath to investigators mm-hmm. and telling her scripting her what to say she was resistant she's like no i don't want to do it and he's like no you're gonna do it you're gonna say lewinsky was never here in this office but and that's one of the things and here's the thing when that got brought before the senate they said so all you got him on got him on was obstruction of justice i mean obviously it's obstruction of justice but not enough for us to impeach so you got to think about it we're here arguing the semantics and this is the second part if we're here arguing the semantics of well he of, was in that's he obstruction of justice removed. that's right. nowhere close to what the Clinton thing had, and so therefore nowhere close enough. To I, I don't know if I there, – there's some problems I have with that. But okay. it, wasn't ju- it wasn't just that he was on record of, of saying that. What he really got in trouble for was lying under oath there's during two things, sexual yeah. harassment tra- trial. It was perjury. He right. perjured so it was the perjury. And, and, the, and the, worst part, the, wor- the worst part of that was is that they w- the courts would not have been able to ask him that question on his past history, sexual history before he got into office and championed a bill that he signed into law that gave prosecutors the ability to do that. Mm -hmm. Then he skirted his own law that he championed when it came time for him to be in court to do that. So here's my thing. That's the perjury part. I'm specifically talking about the obstruction part. Perjury, perjury to me, like the Clinton, uh, Clinton should have never been impeached for that. I I just disagree completely. I, I, no, you do, but that, <laughs> I also disagree. I'm sorry, Chris. Uh, I, I absolutely like the idea that uh, a president ought to be removed from office. No, I didn't say he should have been removed. I said he should have been impeached. Well, he did get uh, impeached. I, I mean, uh, yeah, it, and, and, and that's, that's what's going that's to your happen. prerogative. And but that's I, what could happen here. But I think that the whole point of the entire investigation with both Clinton and and Trump the the foundational premise are all bad so it's the fruit of the poisonous tree and so the process crime that you get clinton and you get trump on is it, is nonsense to me it was not a process crime for clinton perjury he he, he perjured himself mm-hmm. but he was he was in a lo- lawsuit sexual harassment suit w- what do you mean it's not a process crime like what why do you think he's Purging, sitting, why do you think he's sitting in there court? Having, is not a process crime? Why is he in court in the first place? Because someone came forward and accused him of sexual harassment. Okay. So 
you go have a trial. When you perjure yourself in, in a court, you're denying that other person the right to a fair trial. Mm -hmm. But he's also the president. And the president shouldn't probably have even sat down to have that deposition in the first he place. He tried not to, and the courts told him he had to. Okay. Well, he also but accidentally got point, in it. Because actually, specifically, it wasn't the Lewinsky one. He, we're talking about the perjury happened during the Flowers one. And they, they pulled them aside. They said, by the way, you're under oath. No, I think it was no, Paula no, no, no. It was Paula Jones. It was Paula, Paula Jones. Jones. Sorry, not Flowers. The Paula Jones, Jones trial. Sorry. And they asked him, yeah. have you ever had sexual relations outside of your marriage? And he said no. Yes. And then Linda Tripp, who was friends with no, Monica I think Lewinsky. Was, I think he was specifically asked about Lewinsky. And that he was. was might have been. Might have been. But, right. he was, but that was fine until Linda Tripp, who was friends with Monica Lewinsky, found out that she had evidence that he was lying, brought it to the attorney general, Janet Reno. Right. Janet Reno then went to the special prosecutor and said, hey, I know you've been doing this whitewater thing. I want you now to go investigate this. Kenneth Starr petitioned Janet Reno to investigate that. Trip got, Trip got to Jonah Goldberg's mother, who then got that information to Brett Kavanaugh. Mm-hmm. And the special counsel's office in Ken Starr's office. And then Ken Starr went to Janet Reno and asked to expand the investigation to Monica Lewinsky and to see right. if there were and crimes. She, and she said yes. He was set up from the beginning. The point is, is Donald it, it, can Bill Clinton effectively execute the office of the presidency if America knows that he's a liar? <laughs> like, Donald Trump. Do, I think at the end of, once we get finished reading all this, you go... What is what in here is uh, rising to the level that this person must the will of the voters must be overturned and he must be removed from office because his crimes are so egregious that he must be stopped now. And I will tell you right now, I don't think that he should. Right. But that doesn't mean I don't think he should possibly be impeached. And it really comes down to what do the Democrats think politically mm -hmm. is going to be beneficial for them or not. Sure. Like. So far in these in these quote unquote crimes, nothing here is rising to the level that tells me that Donald Trump is using his high office for high crimes and misdemeanors, which means he's in a special position to use his office to benefit personally. And and we have to remove him from office because he's such a grave danger to the to the United States. I, I wish that were the case of the history of impeachment. That's well, not. <laughs> I, I'm 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 rising to the standard that it ought to be, right? Okay, <laughs> you know, and I don't feel that Bill Clinton, at the end of the day, it, it, the the idea that he censured, yes, put it on his. Well, that's technically what an impeachment is sure. if you don't get removed through the Senate process. It was also a huge political error for Republicans, and that that killed the the momentum of the '94 election. Because they just couldn't stop thinking about Bo Clinton's dick. I, I disagree because Al Gore should have walked right into that office and won hands down. Well, he was also a shitty there candidate. Was a lot, well, there was a lot of blowback he, he couldn't even for what people state. felt about Clinton right. at the time. Bill Clinton. So people were willing to give George Bush a try because they were tired of the Clinton thing. Bill Clinton could have won a third term in office. The economy was I don't, so good. No, it wasn't. It was, it was in the Bill middle Clinton, of a recession this Bill last Clinton year. Bill Clinton walked out with almost 60% approval ratings. Dot com had fallen. The last year he was in office, uh, it all busted. The, the economy was tanking. That's why George Bush ran on, I'm going to give back everybody $1,000 because the economy was so bad. He wanted mm -hmm. to get the economy going again. Bill Clinton was an incredibly – he, he left office with one of the highest popularity ratings of any president ever. He's he, very popular because he's very charismatic, which is how he gets away with all the stuff that he well, did. He's an effective president too. I – The, there was a lot of stuff going on that wasn't all him either in sure. that whole process. The Newt Gingrich's Congress was doing a lot too to help make sure that we kept, because he wanted to spend a lot and he couldn't spend. You could also go back to the Bush tax increases and balanced budget amendments yeah. and, all, uh, and all that helped Clinton as well. But Dennis is giving props to Cl Nixon and Newt Gingrich in the same episode. I'm like, my mind over here is exploding. And I'm defending well, so here's the thing. I, 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 dis Bill Clinton. I just I can disagree with somebody's politics, but I can still appreciate the fact that they can do what they're trying to do, that, that they have political knowledge and they know what they're doing. 
I, right. If, That's what I really get concerned about is we have so many people in politics running things that don't have the, the ability to really do the job. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, get back on track. Yeah. Um, get back on it. I, I do want to give my opinion on impeachment, but we'll let's get through these first. Let, let's uh, Hody. I will come back. I promise to let you do that at the end when we talk about whether these are all impeachable or not. Okay. Right. Uh, the efforts to curtail the special counsel's investigation. Uh, two days after directing McGahn to have the special counsel removed, the president made another attempt to affect the course of the Russia investigation. On June 19, 2017, the president met one-on-one -on -one in the Oval Office with his former campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski, a trusted advisor outside the government, and dictated a message for Lewandowski to deliver to Sessions. The message said that Sessions should publicly announce that, Notwithstanding his recusal from the investigation, the investigation was, quote, very unfair to the president. The president had done nothing wrong, and Sessions planned to meet with the special counsel and, quote, let him move forward with investigating election, election meddling for future elections. Lewandowski said he understood what the president wanted Sessions to do. One month later, in another private meeting with Lewandowski on July 19th, 2017, the president asked about the status of his message for Sessions to limit the special counsel investigation to future election interference. Lewandowski told the president that the message would be delivered soon. It's in the mail, Mr. President. <laughs> Hours after that meeting, the president publicly criticized Sessions in an interview with the New York Times and then issued a series of tweets making it clear that Sessions' job was in jeopardy. Lewandowski did not want to deliver the president's message personally, so he asked senior White House official Rick Dearborn to deliver it to Sessions. Dearborn was uncomfortable with the task and did not follow through. Um, so again, it goes back to Trump wanting to look a certain way to the public so he has more room to maneuver. Um, efforts to prevent public disclosure of evidence. In July 2017, the president was, at, was learning that the media outlets were asking questions about June 9th, 2016 meeting in the Trump Tower between uh, campaign officials, including his son and a Russia lawyer, who said to be offering damaging information on Clinton as part of the Russia and government support for Mr. Trump. On several occasions, the president directed aides not to publicly disclose the emails setting up the June 9th meeting, suggesting that the emails would not leak and that the number of lawyers with access to them should be limited. Before the emails became public, President edited a press statement for Trump Jr. by deleting a line that acknowledged that the meeting with an individual who Trump Jr. was told might have information helpful to the campaign, and instead said only that meeting was about adoptions of Russian children. When the press asked questions about the President's involvement in the statement, the President's personal lawyer repeatedly denied the President had any role. So... This particular one is the president lying to the public and trying to mislead the public, but not necessarily the investigation. Uh, further in efforts to have the attorney general take control of the investigation. In early 2017, the president called Sessions at home and again asked him to reverse his recusal from the Ru Russia investigation. Sessions did not reverse it. In 2017, October of 2017, the president met privately with Sessions in the Oval Office and asked him to take a look at investigating Clinton. In December 2017, shortly after Flynn pled guilty pursuant to a cooperation agreement, agreement, the president met with Sessions in the Oval Office and suggested, according to notes taken by a senior advisor, that if Sessions unrecused and took back supervision of the Russia investigation, he would be a, quote, hero. The president told Sessions, I'm not going to do anything or direct you to do anything. I just want to be treated fairly. In response, Sessions volunteered that he had never seen anything improper on the campaign and told the president there was a whole new leadership team in place. He did not unrecuse. Um, and people say that Donald Trump isn't coachable, that he's just a flying off the handle. I'm not going to do anything here. I'm not even going to tell you to do anything. I just want to be told. Like, that to me is Donald Trump being coached by lawyers and actually listening, which is a skill I didn't think that he had, honestly. Uh, next, efforts to have McGahn deny that the president had ordered him to have the special counsel removed. Uh, in early 2018, the press reported that the president had directed McGahn, had directed McGahn to have the special counsel removed in June 2017. So summer of 2017, he has that phone call. In early 2018, the press starts reporting that that phone call existed. 
The president reacted to the news stories by directing White House officials to tell McGahn to dispute the story and create a record stating that he had not been ordered to have the special counsel removed. McGahn told those officials that the media reports were accurate in stating that the president had directed McGahn to have the special counsel removed. The president then met with McGahn in the Oval Office and pressured him to deny the reports. In the same meeting, the president also asked McGahn why he had told the special counsel about the president's efforts to remove the special counsel and why McGahn took, why McGahn took noted of his, why McGahn took notes with his conversations with the president. McGahn, uh, I don't know because you're insane <laughs> and I need cover my ass information so I don't go to pound me in the ass prison, Mr. President. I hope that was his response. McGahn refused to back away from what he remembered happening and perceived the president to be testifying his medal. You didn't hear the response that he gave? Testing the medal, no. He responded with, because I'm a lawyer. And that's what real, because I'm a real lawyer. And then Trump said, but I don't know, I, none of my lawyers have ever done that before. Ray Cohn didn't do that before. And I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, you know, but here's an example of, I mean, you definitely know what, Trump wants, but he's just asking why you did that, you know? So he's very crafty. Like he's, he's ham fisted, but he's still sneaky enough to not go to prison. Like he, he's, I, I, after kind of reading the report, I went, he's not as stupid as I thought he was. He, I think he's, I think he's stupid, but he's also had enough conversations with enough people in negotiating purposes and stuff like that, that he knows how to be slimy about it. Right. Yeah. He knows how to not to go to prison. Yeah. He's, he's been here before. Um, Conduct towards Flynn and Mandafort redacted after a Flynn, after Flynn withdrew from a joint defense agreement with the president and began cooperating with the government, the president's personal counsel left a message for Flynn's attorneys, reminding them of the president's warm feelings towards Flynn, which he said was still remains and asking for a heads up. If Flynn knew, information that implicates the president. Um, when Flynn's counsel reiterated that Flynn could no longer share information pursuant to a joint defense agreement, the president's personal counsel said he would make sure that the president knew that Flynn's actions reflected hostility towards the president. During Manafort's prosecution and when the jury in the criminal trial was deliberating, the president praised Manafort in public, said that Manafort was being treated unfairly and declined to rule out a pardon. After Manafort was convicted, the president called Manafort a brave man for refusing to break and said that flipping almost ought to be outlawed. Um, and conduct involving Michael Cohn is next. The president's conduct towards Michael Cohn, a former Trump Organization executive, uh, changed from praise for Cohn when he falsely minimized the president's involvement in the Trump Tower Moscow project to castigation of Cohn when he became a cooperating witness. Um, from September 2015 to June 2016, Cohen had pursued the Trump Tower Moscow project on behalf of the Trump Organization and had briefed candidate Trump on the project numerous times, including discussing whether Trump should travel to Russia to advance the deal. 2017, Cohen provided false testimony to Congress about the project, including stating that he had only briefed Trump on the project three times and never discussed travel to Russia with him in an effort to adhere to a party line that Cohen said was developed to minimize the president's connections to Russia. Um, sorry, I moved, my, I moved my place and I've lost it. While preparing for his congressional testimony, Cohen had extensive discussions with the president's personal counsel, who, according to Cohen, said that Cohen should stay on message and not contradict the president after the FBI searched Cohn's home and office in April 2018, the president publicly passed messages of support to him. Cohn also discussed pardons with the president's personal counsel and believed that if he stayed on message, he would be taken care of. Uh, then the president called him a rat. <laughs> uh, based on these 10 episodes, the special counsel doesn't find that Donald Trump actually obstructed justice. However, Mueller never confirmed that Trump did not obstruct justice, stating that, quote, if we had confidence after a thorough investigation of the facts that the president clearly did not commit obstruction of justice, we would state, state that. So he, he kind of punts. Uh, he adds, Trump's efforts to influence the investigation were mostly unsuccessful, but that is largely because the persons who surrounded the president declined to carry out orders 
to accede his requests. Um, Quita Jarek, the managing editor of Lawfare, created a heat map with an in-depth explanation of the 10 episodes of obstruction. Uh, that can be found in our show notes. Um, so there was always a reason for the potential episodes of obstruction of justice, the, the reason they were inclu- inconclusive. Um, so, for example, the report says Trump told White House comms director Hope Hicks and others not to disclose information about the Trump Tower meeting. But Mueller wrote that evidence does not establish that Trump was specifically trying to prevent Mueller's team or Congress from obtaining those emails. Now, Congress can still act against Donald Trump on obstruction charges. Mueller wrote that Congress can validly regulate the president's exercise of official duties to prohibit actions motivated by a corrupt intent to obstruct justice. And Mueller outlines a lengthy constitutional analysis arguing that a congressional move against Donald Trump wouldn't undermine his executive power in Article 2. Now, Mueller's team wasn't happy with Trump's written responses and wanted an in-person interview, but ultimately believed their other sourcing was enough. And upon receiving Trump's written answers in 2018, uh, Mueller's team notified Trump's lawyers that they were insufficient that, quote, the president stated on more than 30 occasions that he does not recall or remember or have independent recollection of information called for by the questions. The investigators concluded subpoenaing Trump, but ultimately decided that any benefits from an interview would be outweighed by fighting the lengthy lawsuit that would be sure to follow. Um, Mueller wrote that the investigation ultimately, quote, determined the substantial quantity of information we had obtained from other sources allowed us to draw relevant factual conclusions with intent and credibility on intent and credibility, which are often inferred from circumstantial evidence and assessed without direct testimony from the subject of the investigation. Um, So a a, a few uh, fun things from the report before we kind of wrap up with our analysis. Um, The BBC wrote an article, The Stranger Parts of the Mueller Report You May Have Missed, Mueller disputed fees at a Trump golf course. In the days following the appointment of the special counsel, Robert Mueller, to investigate the accusations of collusion with Russia, the president aired concerns to his inner circle, including then chief strategist Steve Bannon, that there were conflicts of interest. These included that Mueller had been interviewed for an FBI director position shortly before his appointment and that he had worked for a law firm that represented people affiliated with the president. However, this third and final concern was more bizarre as Trump claimed Mueller had disputed certain fees relating to his membership at a Trump golf course in Northern Virginia. So that's the basis of his uh, compromat on Mueller. Russians paid people to dress like Santa in Trump masks. Mr. Mueller investigated whether Russia's internet research agency was exploiting political divisions in the U.S. on the request of Mr. Trump. Mr. Mueller writes that he could not identify evidence that any U.S. persons knowingly or intentionally coordinated with the IRA. However, there was evidence presented of U.S. rallies organized by the Russian agency involving some colorful tactics. The IRA recruited moderators of conservative social media groups to promote IRA-generated content, as well as recruited individuals to perform political acts, such as walking around New York City dressed up as Santa Claus with a Trump mask. Uh, Lawyers don't take notes. The report describes Trump scolding White House Don McGahn for taking notes in meetings with special counsel's office with investigator. The president asks, what about these notes? Why do you take notes? Lawyers don't take notes. I never had a lawyer that took notes. McGahn responded that he keeps notes because he is a, quote, real lawyer and explained that notes create a record and are not a bad thing. The president is then quoted as saying, I've had a lot of great lawyers like Roy Cohn. The, he didn't take notes. Top legal official in, in always carried out a, a top legal official always carried a resignation letter. In light of the president's frequent public attack, Sessions prepared another resignation letter and for the rest of the year carried it with him in his pocket every time he went to the White House. Uh, so those are some of the more color. The lawyers don't take notes. <laughs> Such a Trump thing. Like I'm a real lawyer, sir. Not one of the ones that pretended to be a lawyer on The Apprentice. Right. Yeah, and then he used Ray Cohn. <laughs> what, what's going on with Ray Cohn now? <laughs> uh, anyway, is he in jail or dead? Yeah. <laughs> is he whacked? Um, so Roy Cohn, if you don't know, was a mob lawyer that Trump hung out in the, in the late 70s, early 80s and was like his hero. 
and taught him how to be a real man. And basically, Donald Trump then how to be a slime. he just ascended the the Golden Tree House in 1983, as Maggie Haberman says, and then never like stretched himself, never grew, doesn't know how the world has changed. And so Donald Trump is just the same guy mm-hmm. that he just thinks everybody's a, a mob lawyer in 1978. I mean, that's how he and, made his killing. And right. real estate was just getting in bed with all the, the mob contractors and everything yeah. else and making the deals that other people couldn't make. There's genuinely, there was a report that he genuinely thought that when he was going to become president, he was going to be like one of those mob lawyers with a bat behind his desk. And if somebody didn't do what he wanted, he would just beat them with a bat. <laughs> Like, I think that was in the Fire and Fury book. Mm-hmm. Um, so here's the thing. Like, a lot of this is unsurprising information. It's, it's information that we've heard before. Like, I don't think any of us are surprised that Donald Trump has been behind, acting badly behind the scenes and trying to coerce and cajole people into not cooperating. But a lot of it, he, he seems to have towed a very fine line in every one of these episodes where... He's saying, don't talk to the media this way. Don't present it that way. You know, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but do, you know, just make sure you have my back. Like very vague statements. He, he's been very cagey about all of it. And so I think the idea that you're ever going to get you, if you have a, a, a majority of Democrats in the house, you're going to get an impeachment charge. You're never going to get him removed on any of this stuff. And so impeachment, in my mind, is just going to be a tremendous waste of everyone's time and energy and effort. And I think Hillary, I think uh, Nancy Pelosi agrees with me because she's basically said as just as much. But it, I mean, did you gonna... he, did you hear anything in there, uh, Reinhold, that made you go, he ought to be impeached and or removed from office? I heard things in there that showed a pattern of behavior that is, is something that should be considered, but I don't. I personally don't think that we should be wasting our, we should have wasted the last two years on this. It's a complete and total waste of time because not only have we wasted this time on this, but real issues, real, real criticism against Trump is being ignored and fallen by the wayside. We, we like and, this and, pattern yeah. of behavior mm-hmm. is something that he was elected on. Like yeah. that's the thing about all this is that barely elected on. It's not like he had a landslide. He's still the duly elected oh, president of the United States. I agree States. completely. You know, I'm not saying I mean, he's not. And so to overturn the will of the voters on something that we because know, he beat it's like the only person in the world who he could beat, <laughs> Hillary. I mean, have you seen the twenty twenty two field of Democrats? Like, I don't know, man. I'm, I look at it and go, They're making the libertarians look good. Honestly, oh, that's. Uh, I mean, have you seen the big yellow hat? Um, <laughs> I honestly think. They can, they're going to fuck it up. Like, I think he's going to get a second term if I they don't keep know. this up. Like, I, I, I really don't know. It really depends on if somebody gets in and it, it's going to depend a lot on what happens in the next two years. And that's where everybody's going to be focusing the next couple, uh, at least months, is do we go forward with an impeachment or do we not? Is this going to be political advantageous or is it going to make us heroes or is it not? And my, I mean, I look at it and say, I'm waiting for Congress to take back the power they're supposed to be have that they've ceded to the president all these years. Maybe this is the beginning of it. Maybe they're going to finally do something. They when they tried to override um, a veto and they couldn't, but they, they vetoed what he was doing. What was it? Was it Yemeni? The the Yemeni thing where he they told him he couldn't do it and he overrode it or something like that. I can't remember exactly. Or he vetoed it. Um, uh, I sort of know what you're talking yeah, yeah, about. I, yeah, it's, it's just escaping it's not, me. For some it's reason, not but, coming to my mind either. But it's, it's it's that sort of thing where I'm like seeing signs that maybe Congress has been pushed pushed so far by his actions that they may start reeling some of that back in. That was always my hope when he got elected was that okay maybe we'll see now the folly of giving the, a president that much power right that they're not supposed to have. The, con- the Constitution doesn't say they're supposed to have. And, and people will start saying, okay, we need to pull that power back. Right. Uh, and hopefully this is happening. I don't know. I mean, this might be part of that. He might get impeached. He might not. There's no way he gets removed from office over this. We need to, I would rather we start talking about real issues and real things that we should be talking about. But I also understand that the Democrats are going to look at this as a possible way to win in 2020. Right. And they're going to weigh their options on whether it's politically viable or not. Yeah. Hody, impeachable, removable, what do you think? 
So we're talking about tactics right now. And it is a, if I am a Democrat, it's a bad move to try and impeach him because here's what's going to happen. You're going to Clinton him because what he has done is nowhere close to as bad or shameful as what Clinton did. Yeah. And Clinton, you had it on record. It was straight up obstruction. It was straight up perjury. This, it just sounds like he's kind of a bad spooky guy. And so you just say, it's nowhere close to that, right? And so what, it, what you happened? Feed, you feed into the narrative that he's a persecuted figure, that mm -hmm. it's boomer, Republican yeah. Christians, all uh, white. They all think a, they're, they're persecuted. This, it's going to galvanize his base. Right. Yeah. It's going to galvanize their base. How yep. does it play with the rest of America? Independence. It well, and, see, and, and, and then what you're going to do is you're going to get those Democrats that run that are like, well, I didn't vote for the Trump impeachment. I'm the moderate. That's um, that was the successful Democrats last election. That's going to be the successful Democrats this election, and they know it. So if they if they try to push it forward, you're going to get a few extremes that live in their Californias and their Colorados and the far and the and the crazy blue states, and just say, "Hey, I did the bluest thing possible." But the majority of them that are in a normal state are going to say, "Look, I don't like the guy, but this wasn't worth impeaching." And that's what the most normal people are going to say, and that's going to push the country in that moderate direction. But I I still think that it's all going to come down to the when the election comes around, the Democrats are not going to stay home this time. They stayed home because of Hillary, thinking she had it in the bag, and they didn't go out and vote. Mm -hmm. There's no way they let that happen again. Which right. Trump really has to step it up and win by more than he had before. So unless he is really pulling in the moderates, which polling has shown that he's not, then he's not going to get reelected. But we still have two years to go. We don't know what's going to happen with this fallout. I, I think if they try to impeach him over this, like you just – like with Clinton, he broke laws. And Hody's mm -hmm. right. It was a very clear – cut case of you broke the law and so then you go okay well do we set the example that it's just okay to break the laws like or do you do you have to be punished for breaking laws like with this it's not clear cut that he broke laws like you have these 10 instances but there's not 10 clear cut cases like there was with with uh with nixon and with clinton and so to drag the country through this exercise that's hugely divisive over things that aren't clear cut, it just seems so wrong headed from a, a strategery point of view for the Democrats. And you go, look at the way that that affected the, the Republican Congress. You know, the massive, A, all of the Republicans leading the entire uh, Clinton impeachment were asked to leave their offices because of their sex scandals, including Bob Barr. Um, you you had major losses in the house that next year uh, because people just looked at this and said, I just don't care what the president did with his dick. Like just govern the country. My pocketbook's feeling right. Like I, I just, I'm hopeful about the future. I like Bill Clinton and you guys are, you guys are persecuting him. And, and so what people just really don't seem to ever learn. And I don't know why we haven't learned this at this point is that when you, when you go after Trump or you go after AOC or you go after and you like, you like unfairly criticize, oh, yeah. you end up making more people feel sympathy for that person. Criticizing Donald Trump for literally every tiny little thing has just mm -hmm. made Donald Trump. And so impeachment would just, for, over some bullshit, would be the ultimate coup de grace for this guy. Right. You know, I mean, and so if you don't like him, just do better. Like instead of like the whole argument of this is not who we are has never worked against uh, Donald Trump at all. Like appealing to Americans higher moral authority doesn't work when you're a politician and nobody believes that you have moral authority to begin with. You know, nobody believes that Bill Crystal is some sort of uh, moral figure that has the right to stand up and say that. This is just not who we are as a country. Like, nobody cares what you think, Bill Crystal. Like, you led to a – your dumb ideas led to the Iraq invasion. Like, nobody takes you seriously. No, nobody cares what your moral preening is. And so in, impeachment with this set of facts is just another level of moral preening. It's just another level of making him look persecuted. And it just re it just guarantees that he's going to end up getting elected. It's great for their base, so that's why Pete, 
Buttigieg and all these other, and Kamala Harris and everybody's lining up to say, let's impeach him because it looks good to their base. But in practice, it is going to completely retract the gains that the Democrats saw in this last election. And it's really just going to give Donald Trump a stage to shine, which is I'm the, I'm the victim here. I'm the victim. And if I'm the victim, you're the victim. But the whole and people love that. All the gains that the Democrats made were because of the pounding that they were giving Trump for the most part. I mean, no, I don't they agree. They actually with that. should have been more than what they were. It, and it, the whole Kavanaugh thing caused some problems there, but right. they that hurt them. Yeah. The Kavanaugh affair the Kavanaugh hurt thing them. Did. And if Donald Trump hadn't switched to immigration and just pounded Kavanaugh, he wouldn't have had <laughs> such bad losses. The reason, and Hody touched on it, the reason that Democrats really did well in this last midterm is because they ran a lot of moderate Democrats, veterans, sane Democrats. The Ilan Omars and the AOCs have become the poster child of this Congress. And that's not who was elected. Who was elected were, you know, like Dan Crenshaw Democrats. I'm not, like, mm -hmm. if you... If you're familiar with Dan Crenshaw, because he just seems like, oh, here's a Republican who doesn't seem that crazy. He seems a little, you know, like that's what got elected on the Democratic side. You don't hear about those guys because there's the blue dog, the liberal yeah. press only face. Uh, yeah, the blue dog, the more blue dog Democrat. There's no media constituency for that group of people. There's conservative right. press that will elevate Dan Crenshaw. There's liberal press like the Turks that will elevate AOC. But nobody elevates the suburban red state democrat that because media is geared is geared towards extremes you know with the exception of we are libertarians which had nine hundred and fifty five thousand downloads in the last year almost a million um and so you you that's what that's what won last year and they don't seem to get i think nancy pelosi gets that and i think she she understands that this is a bad road schumer understands this is a bad road but I don't think that they, at the end of the day, can help themselves. So whether or not they choose to impeach is still to be seen. I don't know if they will or not. But they're going to try to make hay out of it for the next however many months they can. They're going to drag it out as much as they can. They've already subpoenaed um, McGahn to come testify. Right. So they're going to have some investigations. They're going to do their own look and see whether or not it was obstruction of justice. That's another six months right. of this. This isn't going away in the next couple of days, mm -hmm. you know? So, and, and the other thing to think about too, that to realize too, and I, I just, I don't know if you want to do this as, I got some things to say in closing, so we'll wait okay. till then, but. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I'm going to be curious to see which way they decide to go based off of polling, their internal stuff, their, their lay of the land, what the, what the election 2020 looks like as mm -hmm. far as uh, battleground states, what people in those battleground states are saying, not just presidential, but also Congress and Senate. Mm -hmm. That's all going to be taken into account over the next couple of months. You know, there are people crunching numbers and doing calls and all kinds of polling going on right now. Right. Oh, for sure. I mean, the, just the fact that the presidential race has started in, in March of the year before, like it used to be March so, of 2020 yeah. and now it's March of 2019. It's crazy. It's they, when they were talking about Bill Weldon announcing. I'm like, it was way too soon. And then all of a sudden there's 20 Democrats. I'm like, oh my God. Everybody's crowning uh, Buttigieg, but you go, yeah, he's an attractive figure. But honestly, you remember Fred Thompson? Like, think back to 2008. Think back to how many Republicans were crowned. And every every three weeks, there was a new front runner. Well, and that's the thing, too, is he hasn't been vetted yet. Right. <laughs> you know, they haven't they haven't got to him and figured out where his weak spots are and, and what they can do to make him crumble. And the Democrats are trying to figure that out even more than the Republicans are because they want to counter it or head it off and get rid of him if he's going to be a problem. Right. So that stuff's going on right now. Who knows? how this is going to turn out yet. All right. Let's start wrapping up. Um, let's, uh, let's give Hody the, the final thoughts here. Uh, let's have you start, Hody. 
All right. So two things. First of all, uh, I am in fav- flavor of impeaching everybody pretty much all of the time. All right. I get this because of the NFL. And you have the National Football League where you require an intervention in order to get uh, in order for you to get in trouble. You need somebody else to catch you. Right. Versus teams catching themselves. Now, if you were to say, hey, I'm going to strip you of your titles if one person on your team takes steroids, who do you think then is going to do the policing of making sure their players aren't roided out? Do you think it's the NFL or do you think it's the team itself that has their title? It's going to be the teams themselves. You see here, and this, this whole investigation it, it is just an, an opportunity for us to say, we need these White House policing themselves. They should constantly be afraid that they're not being transparent enough. They should constantly be afraid that they're not being forthcoming enough. They should constantly be afraid that the American people aren't going to like what they're doing behind closed doors because there are closed doors. Open them up. Look, we saw your WikiLeaks stuff. We've seen everything Julia Assange has to offer. They're not hiding any secrets that they can't tell us. They're hiding every secrets they don't want us. They're hiding secrets they don't want us to know. And so, frankly, I am done with the closed door thing. I am all for the GoPro presidency. They, we should be seeing everything that they're seeing at this point. Yes, barring certain passwords and launch codes and all that. Blah, I get it. But other than that, we shouldn't be having this, everybody leaves the room so I can you know, boss somebody around and bully him. And yeah, the bullying didn't really work for Trump because people just ignored what he had to say this time. And that's funny. And it's funny to talk about. But ultimately, it's going to be somebody who's a little more successful at bullying, like Bill Clinton, next time. And it's going to be about millions of dollars on the line that hurts people's li- livelihoods, that cost them dearly. The whole Trump thing should be Trump trying to be as forthcoming as possible. The issue they have in the NFL is the same issue we're having in the White House. The onus is on us to try and get what we can, and their responsibility is to try and sweep it all under the rug as opposed to attempting to be as transparent as possible. I get it. It's the will of the people. He got elected. He got voted in. But if he broke the law, who cares? Get him out. I've done plenty of things that I regret, and then somebody – I mean, heck, I supported supported Joshua Smith for the LNC for a bit, dude. That was dumb as heck. Okay, Dude, how I re- dumb is that? Like, we, I totally yeah. regret it. Okay, like, was this in your review? Turn it. No, honestly, you're an A minus now. Like, <laughs> yes, <that's> such <laughs> bad I, judgment. Fair enough. I I deserve it. I, that's the most offensive thing to ever happen on this program. Is that statement right there? And that <laughs> includes me turning Greg Lenz into the NSA. Yeah. <laughs> So I just like it was it was bad judgment on my part, but I was excited. I liked the fact that I could that I finally had a chairperson who was willing to talk to me one on one, who was willing to be my friend and hear my issues out versus the current one, which I could send 80 emails to and he still wouldn't remember who I was and do great things for the party would have no idea. So I was blinded because of that information. American people. All right, and look, here's the thing. Oh, no, we've impeached the president. We got to get a new one. Oh, but the vice president does the, same, does the same stuff. Impeach him too. Make an impeachment culture out of this whole thing. Make it really obvious that if you're not totally compliant and transparent and doing what the American people want to do or what you said you were going to do and being honest and obeying all the laws, you're out. I am so sick of these people staying in office for all these four years. I'd be cool with Pence and then Pence would do something awful and then get replaced. And then we have the speaker and then we get to replace her. I'm just excited for an impeachment mentality. That being said, I'm aware it's not tactically popular. That's point one. Point number two is the, this is, didn't come up and this is very tangential to what we were talking about, but at the end of the, the, both the report and the indictment, like the last hundred pages, are the Russians actually trying to hack the election? Like really trying to actually like get into voting booths and, and it, it, hack the election? It's funny because that's like a quarter of the report, but it's not the Trump part. So we just ignore it because Trump, you know, it's not looking at Trump. It's just like, oh, I guess here's them trying to do something with the election, I guess. So we have them trying to hack. Now they actually successfully spearfish somebody at a federal agency who releases a whole bunch of voting records. This is the federal agency, uh, the federal agency that was established with the Patriot Act who collected people's information. So they accidentally gave 
your voting information. It was, uh, they didn't reveal who, but 500,000 some people, they gave your information to the Russians. Russian operatives have it. So what did the Russian operatives do with that information? They then went to the states and tried to get into the states the same way they attempted to get into the federal government, the DNC, and the Clinton campaign. What happened on all those state levels? All of them, the security was too tight. Even if they got somebody to fall for the spear phishing, there was multiple uh, multiple security requirements there. Your security is better with the state than it is with the federal government. <laughs> and that is painfully obvious with this report. And so I, I encourage you to just think about that for a moment. When you just say, well, I don't know if I'm big enough, if the government's big enough for me to be safe. I don't know if it's small enough for you to be safe. Frankly, the people who were in charge of protecting your information through that Patriot Act, through trying to keep you safe, failed. And they gave your information to Russian operatives. What happened at your local level and state level when they tried to get into your ballots and your booths and actually use that information? No successes. And so this to me just says politics, you got to stop thinking federal and start thinking local. And those are my two points. All right. Very and good. I agree with uh, most of what he said right there, especially the first part about the impeach culture. It's time we start telling our government it needs to do what it's supposed to do and quit acting like a bunch of maniacs. Yeah. And I don't know how, what other way we do that because our, that, and that, that's part of the problem is that our people seem to want that the way they're acting because the majority of people vote these people back in time and time again, these people are in office for 60 years. Let, why are we allowing that to happen? Um, that if they try to do the impeachment, it's not politically viable, right? Because the will of the people don't want to see that. The culture needs to change. You know, I mean, just impeaching him is not going to succeed that. But I would, I want to see the culture change and finally just say, hey, we're tired of both of you just acting this way. And if they're, and I just think that if there was somebody who was politically intelligent enough in running in the Libertarian Party, we'd have something. Because I don't think Hillary would, did any kind of good job. I don't think Trump did a really good job. We were smart about what they did. And I don't think it's going to happen again yeah. in 2020. So, but the only problem is, is that we don't have anybody better politically, I mean, political knowledge wise to counter it. Yeah. Well, the party won't let them right. develop that knowledge. Like that's, yes, the, yes. that's the reality is that, if you want to do politics, the Libertarian Party is a very poor place to do it. Like it just, it's a, it's a poor vehicle for that. Like there, there is a very vocal minority within the party that just refuses. They want, they want mediocrity. They want to keep the club small, and they don't want to do traditional political science. Like hipsterians, right? Like, okay, all right. Couldn't oh, go ahead. One more thing. Um, watch what happens from Trump over the next couple months. He has already started laying the groundwork for this in calling the Democrats treasonous. Right. He's used this word several times in the past two weeks. This is going to be his new attack over the next couple months, is that anybody trying to come after him for impeachment, anybody trying to remove him from office, they're treasonous and trying to overthrow the will of the people. You know, that's in the Constitution is their job. He's going to try to make that case, and it's right. going to be something he's going to say a lot. Yeah, so look for your boomer ant Republican mm -hmm flag waving idiot to to pair at that all right fellas thanks so much for joining us here on the program uh thank you hody you too chris you too dennis good talking to you both all right ryan hold thanks for being here thank you thanks for, for having me in the long drive out and thank you listener for being here as well and uh we will see you uh i'll be back in a couple weeks but we'll have more content for you i'm sure hody will be cranking out what do you got coming up hody so next up we're going to rant on the department of uh energy we, I just finished the Department of Education where I go full Alex Jones. So if you haven't caught that one, uh, I, I come unhinged at the end of that. So that is a good one. Um, but the Department of Energy is coming up. We have a new debate this week. This will be about, and this is just coincidental, but this is our science, uh, energy, and education debate with the presidential candidates. We're going to have that coming up on Thursday, probably be released on Friday. And uh, I am also going to work on the interfacing. And uh, you're going to see a new new interface that is interactive and might have a newsfeed scroll. And I'm kind of playing with it right now, but it looks good. All right. Very good. Very exciting stuff. 
All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us here on the program, and we'll see you next week.